Hey, my friends, I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour, and I've got a question for you. Right? You loosened up. Here we go. What's an evangelical? And give me a second. And time's up. It's harder than you figure, isn't it? My guess is that your initial response was, oh, yeah, I know what an evangelical is. Everybody knows what an evangelical is. It's like the most normal, run of the mill, Protestant kind of Christianity that you hear about all the time. And, uh, yeah, they vote a certain way and they, uh, they like the Bible comes up and I, okay, maybe I don't know exactly what an evangelical is. Was your answer something like that? If so, I think you're in the same boat with most people. It's a tricky word that is a very old word and that has very significant theological implications that represents a very large group uh, percentage of Western Christianity and that also more recently now has political implications. Oh, this means two things. One, the definition of evangelical is probably pretty important. And two, the definition of evangelical is probably pretty slippery. Well, in this ongoing thing that you and I are doing together where we go around, we learn about different expressions of Christianity and try to figure out where all these different expressions fit together in the grand scheme of history. I went and tracked down Dr. Mark Knoll, one of my personal academic heroes. This is a guy I have looked up to and tried to emulate for uh, my entire adult professional life. I've got a ton of his books back here on these shelves. He's one of, if not the foremost experts in the history of Christianity in the United States and Canada, and particularly in the history of evangelicalism. So I caught up with him at Wheaton College at their TV studios, which they were nice enough to let me use for a few minutes, in Wheaton, Illinois, and we talked shop about what an evangelical is, where evangelicalism came from, and where evangelicalism is going next. All of this happens on the occasion of him releasing this new book, Evangelicals, along with David Bebbington and George Morrison, two other rock stars in this field. And we'll talk about this stuff more a little bit later on. So let's go try to nail down an important question. What is an evangelical? And then let's look at the bigger picture of where they came from and where this group is going next. I'm Matt, this is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. Here's me and Dr. Noel talking about evangelicalism. Uh, let me ask maybe an obvious question that I think is hotly debated. What's an evangelical? <laughs> I'm glad that well, made you laugh. I think a lot of people feel that so way. I'm a professional historian, so I've got to say it's complicated. Answering the question, who or what is an evangelical, depends upon how the question is asked. If you're asking the question, what groups associate over time with evangelical forms of Christianity, that's a pretty clear answer. David Bebbington's famous fourfold characterization of evangelicals provides the answer. Evangelicals are people who, in general, value the authority of the Bible, place the authority of the Bible over other authorities, who have had a conversion experience to Christ, or at least some kind of deep personal commitment to Christ, who, who make the death of Christ and the cross the center of their view of salvation, and who are active, usually in evangelism or mission, but in, but in other ways as well. With those characterizations, you get one answer of who are evangelicals. You get another set of answers if you ask, who identifies themselves as evangelicals or with related terms like maybe Bible believers or, or, or spirit-filled. And then you get another answer if you take the current political climate and ask, mm -hmm. are you an evangelical when it comes to American public life? So an evangelical, in my historian's view, would be someone who characteristically shows the qualities, the characteristics that have stood the test of time in explaining who evangelicals are. But when, when survey researchers do any one of those three ways of approaching things, by beliefs and practices, by how people are, are aligned, and then how people feel politically, the answers are, are different. And as a historian, explaining things, you know, it's not really my job to tell people what they must think, but it isn't my job, I think, to try to make people speak as clearly as possible. So based on the definition that you just threw out from Bebbington, I, I guess I'm an evangelical. That, that sounds right. Although if you put my thinking about public life and politics under a microscope, I don't look like an evangelical or not an evangelical. Well, I look very other. But by the definition you just threw out, I know a lot of Catholics. I know a lot of people who historically would have been considered to be on the fringes of what is orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. 
who would right. be called evangelical. So how, right. how big is this tent? That's really a, a really important question, but also one very difficult to uh, answer. And I, I take an example from American political life. So it's been well publicized, and it's often very repeated that 81% of evangelicals so voted for Donald Trump in 2016. Mm -hmm. and people are a little more sophisticated, they say 81% of white evangelicals. But as soon as you say white evangelicals, then you have to raise your question. Now, are there black evangelicals also? Are there church-going, serious-minded, African-American Christians who put the Bible as the supreme authority, trusted in Christ for salvation, mm -hmm. find the death of Christ on the cross, the key thing, are active? Well, there are. Sure. So these people, they must be evangelicals. But in American political history, the only group that has voted more consistently for the Democratic candidates for president than white evangelicals voting for Trump are black, church-going Protestants. So we have a, a conundrum. If you say, well, evangelical means Trump supporter, what about the, the great majority of black churchgoers who look like, talk like, walk like evangelical Christians. So you can see the complications when people simply use the word evangelical and don't specify in particular what the word means. So there's, there's almost two different categories that we're running here though. I mean, if somebody's goal is to advance a political argument or make a case right. or exalt or disparage a group, then this kind of lumping is gonna benefit right. that. It's not nuanced or sophisticated. Right. But the historian's using a different set of lenses. If you're right. trying to analyze something that happened, and you can, you can see the pull of gravity there in this spot in history to say that there's some kind of movement, you can't call it Catholic, and you can't just call it right. Reformed, and you can't just call it Baptist, and it's certainly not Orthodox, it's, it's, it's something. Well, then it falls to, I guess, you and people who do what you do to say, well, what is that thing? Well, even if no one listens to us. <laughs> but I do think that there is reasonable clarity about the nature of evangelical Christianity. So ev evangelicalism, in, used in general and used um, in, in terms of constructing categories, would be a word used for people who show these, these characteristics. The evangelical word it has been used in so many different ways that uh, you have to have uh, clarity. And then the world situation complicates things. Uh, David Bebbington contributes a, a real nice ch a chapter to our book about recent British evangelical political life. And it turns out that though there's a little bit of leaning toward the Conservative Party, um, evangelicals in Britain are just about as likely to vote for the Liberal Party or the, or the, uh, the, the Liberal Democratic Party or the Labour Party as they are for the Conservative Party. So another tricky thing about nailing down who evangelicals are is yeah. the historical question, because off camera a minute ago you were talking about evangelicalism dating back to the 16th century. And I'm guessing there are some people who are sitting here with us who are going, it's not that old. <laughs> is it that old? Where did evangelicalism well, come from? It, interestingly enough, the, the first recorded instance in, in kind of modern Western history or Western history of the term evangelical was applied to the Franciscans of the, of the 13th century. The people who gave up everything to live in poverty to service for God were those who were evangelicals, right? evangelical characteristics. And that would have been the, the usage right up into the 16th century when Martin Luther and other leaders of the Protestant Reformation tried to say that the gospel, the message of good news, salvation in Christ, had been obscured by the difficulties, the corruption in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Their emphasis on the gospel, and of course they were good Greek scholars, meant that they were emphasizing the good news, the evangelion of the message of salvation in Christ. And so very early on in the 1520s and, and 1530s, you find the, the word evangelical being used as an adjective to explain what kind of message the Protestant reformers were presenting. And then um, in, in uh, British history, the evangelical adjective would be, would be applied to those people who are closest to the Reformation. And then eventually in British history, the term evangelical with a capital E, which is unusual, the term evangelical would re refer to those people in the Church of England who felt the greatest kinship to the 
Protestant Reformation to the work that Thomas Cranmer had done in, in the okay. 16th century. So th th there's not really a whole lot of controversy on the use of the adjective historically from the 16th century, maybe into the 19th century. Things begin to get a little complicated. They get complicated in America, but evangelical means th these kind of emphases on the gospel message of free grace in Christ for needy sinners. That's pretty clear. Complications start later. You get into the late 18th century, you got the liberal Western revolutions that right, happened. Right. I feel like that was kind of attached in this country, the United States, to Calvinism. There's that strong reform thread right. where that sort of individualism born out of right. the First Great Awakening somehow right. gains momentum, politicizes, and this, this mindset that is conducive to a Western liberal revolution gets enough steam. But then I've also been taught that it kind of loses steam, that, that Calvinist yeah. impulse in the early 19th. Right. And then we see restorationism. Yeah. Then we see the beginnings of the holiness movement. We see a second great awakening with Charles Finney as one of the highlighting characters who has none of the suspicions right. or right. cautions that Edwards felt right. about what was going on with his great awakening. Where is evangelicalism in the 19th century? Is it, is it all one thing or is it kind of off on one branch and we have the holiness restorationist thing over here? In the 19th century, you, you got uh, what we would today look back and say evangelical Protestants fighting each other on all sorts of issues, except that they were almost all anti-Catholic. They almost all turned to the scriptures for their authority. They almost all practiced some kind of attention to the new birth. So looking back, we can say, well, th those were fairly well united. In the 1840s, Robert Baird wrote a book on Protestant Christianity in, in the United States. And he said, the vast majority of the Protestants are evangelicals. And then he went through all these groups, the, the Calvinists, the, the Presbyterians, New England Calvinists, the New, New England Congregationalists, the Methodists. He didn't say too much about the uh, disciples of Christ, though he could have, because they were rising. He said, basically, in the United States, all the Christian groups are evangelical, except the Catholics, the Mormons who were new. Then he said, the Unitarians. But that too is tricky because way into the 19th century, some Unitarians called themselves evangelicals. Unitarians, many Unitarians way through the 19th century into the 20th century believed that the Bible was inspired, really? believed that Jesus had been raised from the dead, believed that the biblical miracles really took place, but they were Unitarians. They, they believed that whatever Jesus was, he wasn't fully God as the Father was God. And that, that makes things really complicated because you have people who we would say, looking back, well, they're not evangelicals because they're not Trinitarian Protestants. They call themselves evangelicals, which, which screws things up for people who want uh, neat categories. It, it is very problematic for my categories. So certainly I think since the uh, 2012 election where Romney right, was the Republican right, candidate, right, right, right. it looks like what used to be called the Mormon church right. made this very concerted effort to exactly. say LDS, Latter-day Saints, they put up billboards in the towns where I lived and really made an effort to, to just normalize the idea. Right. And I don't say this with criticism or not criticism, but certainly the non-Trinitarian, non-creedal theology of Mormonism mixed with the addition of you know, an extra prophet and an extra scripture, right. like they kind of shot the moon in, right. in, in the, by comparison to the other 19th century groups. But I've been sitting here thinking about the Mormon thing and going, all right, well, how does that work? I think many Mormons would say, I guess I'm an evangelical then. Right. If we kind of look at some of those groups that come out of that 19th century, just very odd time in the fragmenting of the Protestant right, world, right. and we use Bevington's right. descriptors, right. I think we get very different categories than if we just use creedalism, right. which is always kind of where I, I guess I've put it. So by that factor... You could have someone who, a group that is a Bebbington evangelical, but not a historically orthodox right. creedal Definitely. Christian. Is that crazy talk? No, or? it's not. We're going to get into the 20th century because with the formation in the early 1940s of the National Association of Evangelicals, there was an outreach to serious Christian groups who would never have considered themselves evangelicals. Um, the Christian Reformed Church. Missouri Synod Lutherans, although in Germany they were the Evangelische Kirche, <laughs> in America they were they were set apart. Um, um, Mormons, as 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 we know from things that happened just very recently, used to call themselves simply the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. 
Now, all Mormon publicity that I'm aware of calls itself the Church of Jesus Christ yes. of Latter-day Saints. And uh, my friend, Rich Mao, who's been engaged with evangelical Mormon dialogue for, for years and years, says that there'll be some Mormons that are really come very close to having the Bebbington characteristic. Other Mormons who insist upon Joseph Smith as a kind of equal author of scripture would be, would be further away. And I think in the, in the mix up of, of American religious life where nobody's in control, the people who can gain a crowd, gain a crowd, the people who are effective communicators have influence. Sure. It's very difficult to have a kind of creedal definition of evangelical that can actually work to designate a separated category. We met, you mentioned earlier the, the, the fact that in contemporary United States, surveys that emphasize the Bebbington categories will turn up a surprising number of Roman Catholics who, again, apart from loyalty to the Pope, are people who use the language of filled with the Holy Spirit, talk about their uh, desire to live by the Bible, believe that Christ and the cross is the only possible way to salvation. Yeah. And, and there are groups in the United States that actually call themselves now evangelical Catholics. But one of the things that's really interesting is, again, listening to you list off those four Bebbington qualifiers, I, I think evangelicals and Catholics, again, listening first person to them, I think we overwhelmingly agree on the equation of the cross. What was Jesus doing there? What happened with the resurrection? How is the sin and fallenness of humanity resolved? I think the disagreement is in how that's handed off. Right. To the people. nature of the church is, how, remains, how a main, yeah, remains a major distinction. But, but it, Bebbington doesn't, right, it doesn't right. matter for the definition. And, of the, and the, the world that we live in is a different world than when Catholic evangelical tension was at the forefront. We live in a world now where in the United States there are more non-Christian populations. We live in, in uh, uh, the United States where upwards of a quarter of the population responds that they have no re religion. Hmm. And, and in the broader world, it's obvious that the, the, the forces of Christianity of any variety are in competition or, or live in places where uh, non-Christian forces are very strong. So when, when you have 100 people and 98 of them are Christians, then intra-Christian divisions mean a lot. Mm -hmm. If you got 100 people and 40 of them are Christian believers, then, and, and some of the 60 are pushing in, then it's easier to see some similarities that maybe were obscure right. when your tribe and their tribe were the only tribes in the room. Well, you take away the, the power dynamic effects so much yeah. historically. Yeah. If what you had in 1950 were four or five different Christian tribes, obviously a Christian tribe is going to have the sword and the authority, but they're kind of fighting to right, see who's right. going to get to wield it. Now, no Christian tribe's getting the sword. You can just forget that right now. Right. We're not going to run the state. Right. It's a lot easier now that the stakes are lower to be like, hey, you seem all right. Well, was, uh, Timothy George, during these years when he was the dean of the Beeson Divinity School in, in um, Alabama, coined the phrase, the ecumenism of the trenches. And he coined mm -hmm. that phrase to describe the way in which evangelical Protestants and Catholics as pro-life supporters found themselves kind of backing into each other and, and turned around and say, hey, what are you folks doing here? And it turned out that there, there was on that basis, that kind of social action basis, mm. then a platform to discussing in a profitable way some of the other Christ, some of the other religious, theological and practical differences that had separated Catholics and evangelicals. Where does evangelicalism fit in with the the rise of German higher criticism and then the fundamentalist response to that in the late 19th century. George Marsden's 1980 book on fundamentalism was called Fundamentalism and American Culture, the Shaping of 20th Century Evangelicalism. And George was making the point that um, while there was other things involved, the fundamentalist movement is the uh, provided the groups out of which the modern American National Association of Evangelical came and gave, that, that fundamentalist movement gave a kind of impetus to the naming of evangelicals in, in the World War II era and, and, and after. And he, George, in his book and, and later many times said, well, that's not the whole story because there were, there were non-fundamentalist conservative Protestants, Mennonites, Lutherans, 
Christian Reform, who later on are recognized as evangelicals, but really had very little to do with fundamentalism. The holiness movement, Pentecostal movement, could be seen as fundamentalistic in some ways, but re were really quite different. Today, we say, well, of course, th those people were uh, evangelicals. The fundamentalist movement did respond to German higher criticism and responded maybe over aggressively to the idea that evolution had to be atheistic, even though there were a lot of really conservative Protestants at the end of the 19th century said, no, 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 no just wait. There's, there's atheistic evolution and there's evolution studied in other ways. And that was a technical dis discussion. Fundamentalists and their opponents didn't have a whole lot of time for a technical yeah, dis right. discussion. But, but certainly the, the fundamentalist response to, even if it was extreme, to a, approach the Bible that read out the miracles, that said the Bible is basically an account of the uh, religious feeling of the people that wrote the Bible rather than something that actually happened. I mean, the fundamentalists could smell a rat when they, when they saw it. They, they, they knew that to take an extreme approach toward biblical criticism was to eviscerate Christ Christianity. Looking at things from my angle much later, I, I kind of worry at the fundamentalist overreaction because there were Americans, there were British scholars, there were some German scholars who said, well, well of course we need to take advantage of the, the, the historical uh, new information that's coming. Of course we have to take advantage of linguistic information. Of course we have to at least partially question the settled truths that we have about how we interpret the Bible. A moderate approach, a moderate acceptance of, of biblical criticism. Uh, but those moderate voices, as in almost any time and space, get outshouted by the extreme voices. Extreme modernist Christians would say, well, all that old supernatural thing was just somehow adapting the Christian faith to Hellenistic German terms. Fundamentalists, we don't want to save anything to do with modern biblical criticism. And then the clash between fundamentalists and modernists, particularly in the American North, became really serious and led to a kind of divide. My own sense, and I think historians of different denominational traditions conclude, that although the really extreme modernists, the really extreme fundamentalists got a lot of press, there were an awful lot of Christian believers in the middle who said, well, we've got to be sort of open to new ideas, but we also have to hang on to the fundamentals of the faith, the foundations of the faith, the supernaturalism of Christianity, the need of sinners for divine rescue. But those middle, people were just drowned out. <laughs> and, yeah. and they were drowned out in the time, and they've, until fairly recently, been drowned out in the historical accounts as well. Well, let's use modern terms. That stuff doesn't get clicks. Doesn't get clicks. I, people I don't quite see know that. what that means, but I, I, I It sounded you. good when you said it. <laughs> people want to see the, you know, the hyperbolic nuclear yeah, right, hot take right, that right. just burns down and right. owns the people who are wrong. And it, you know, we're a little bit more transparent with wanting to see that right. smackdown kind of language now. But I think we were the same people a yeah. hundred years ago yeah. and just had different means for communicating it. And that secret impulse to really enjoy <laughs> um, my tribe crush yeah. your tribe, my champion hit your champion. And, you know, it's satisfying. But I, I've been doing homework on the tradition that mm -hmm. I've been a part of for a long time. The, the free church yeah. movement, yeah, the definitely. evangelical free church right. is that's. If I have a tribe, I suppose yep. that's it. That's where I went to school. And it's fascinating for me to look at what they did in terms of a doctrinal statement mm -hmm. in the mid-20th century. Yeah. It seems like that was a product of the frictions you just right. described, right. where they're one of these groups that try to go, ooh, big tent, right. historical Protestant orthodoxy. Right. We don't really want to pick a fight on these other things. We have a real nice contribution in our, our book uh, from Tom, Thomas Kidd, who's a... Uh, really good historian at Baylor University, and actually he published his own book on, on modern evangelical. What does evangelicals mean, I think, is the title, something like that. Okay. And his, his emphasis is very much along the lines that, that you just said, that um, although there's other perhaps legitimate way of using the term evangelical, what it really means is a theological tradition, a Christian tradition with certain emphases. His, his list is not quite the Bebbington list, but it's, it's very close. And, and he, he is saying, book published by Yale University Press, that listen, people, when you, in the public is large, when you talk about evangelicals, let's have a little bit of historical responsibility. And then the free church. I, I was quite uh, uh, taken just the last year or two. Am I not, don't have this correct that the free church has dropped in its doctrinal statement the, the, the stance that ministers, at least, 
need to be premillennialist. That's well, correct. The reason that that plank is in there is because in the fundamentalist modernist clash, premillennialism was a way of saying, well, we, we believe the Bible is really true. We believe that prophecy actually predicts things that are going to happen. And the opposition was a kind of squishy postmillennialism that said, well, by human effort, things will just get better. Historically, there's a lot of postmillennial positions that are much different than that modernist one. So you have in a Scandinavian-derived pietist movement coming to America, picking up what are the American points of clash, premillennialism versus kind of squishy postmillennialism, and in, in the doctoral statement. But over time, it becomes less and less obvious that that mm -hmm. plank discriminates between people who love Jesus, think Christianity is a supernatural religion, believe that Jesus rose from the dead, believe that the Holy Spirit can empower believers to live lives of godliness. And if all those things are shared, it just was not valuable to retain a legacy of the past, a remnant of the past that had made a discrimination in the 1920s, but was not making a discrimination in the 2020s. Yes. I remember I came home in 10th grade to my dad wearing a set of blue jeans that I had sliced up. <laughs> of course. Because I mean, I was cool, yeah, I right. guess. And so I did that and dad was like, take them off. I got, dad, come on, I'm, I'm finally cool. <laughs> He's like, no, you look like a gang member. Well, now that sounds ridiculous. Yeah. Everybody's got their jeans all right, gashed right, up, right, who cares? Right, right. But he was right. Yeah. I mean, that, maybe not gang member, but it communicated something that my dad didn't want me to communicate right. in the early 1990s. Whereas now, I mean, come on, it just, yeah. it just means something different. Whereas fundamentally, the genes are either still ripped up yeah. or not ripped yeah. up. Fundamentally, uh, the millennium is going to work one way or right. another, I suppose. And, and it, re and it we'll remains actually, the, the, the details about the second coming of Christ remain important matters for Christian self-understanding. But I think what the Free Church decision basically says is, these questions remain important, but they're less important now than we thought they were when they were instituted. And I, I, I believe that that way of thinking can be multiplied in, in many instances. Evangelical Protestants talking to Catholics, Americans who are tied up in how religion affects politics, talking to people around the world for whom the American political situation is almost completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. and we have other first order matters high on their Christian agenda. Well, and, and that's why that's why I brought up the free church thing. Do you, yeah. do you see this impulse toward looking back at uh, the history of these various evangelical groups? Do you see an impulse toward people saying, you know, maybe we, we drew our lines with a little thicker marker than we needed to, and maybe that isn't top priority we're willing to divide over this, and, and more of an impulse toward a gospel and collegiality kind of mindset? Or do you think we're well, going to continue to like really get after each other over uh, the yeah, details? That's, that's, well, I'm torn, torn to answer because as a historian, you could conclude, well, we're shifting our places where we draw the thick lines, but boy, we still, we've still got some pretty thick lines. So you know, evangelical groups that I know about, some of them are really exercised still about, say, whether women can be ordained to the ministry. A few of the evangelical groups, although not as, nearly as many as before, are really concerned about having your interpretation of biblical prophecy down. So I think objectively you can find still quite a few issues where people are dividing their tribes. On the other hand, by contrast, I think you can find, and maybe I'm just speaking now as a hopeful Christian myself out of my background, I'm hoping, I'm thinking we can find a lot more instances where people recognize their differences aren't ready to give up their differences, realize that they are important, but also realize that a common trust in Christ, a common belief in the divine character of Scripture, a common witness about positive Christian life in the world, a common affirmation that all people are made in God's image, even when we must disagree with how certain lifestyles I, mean, I, I, I see a lot of that, and, and maybe I see a lot of it because I'm looking for it, but I, I hope that there's a lot more than I'm, than I'm just imagining is there.
Do you think people are just going to start dumping the term evangelical and try to move on to something else? Or do you think there's a future for this movement? There certainly is a future for the kind of emphases <laughs> that characterized evangelical Christianity through the years. And, and the, the, the strongest proof of that is how, how rapidly and how deeply evangelical type movements are taking root in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I'm not as confident about the use of the E words in the American public scene. If for, for whatever reason, popular media, Christian media, link the word evangelical with a certain white political stance, then to me that's, that's such a huge deviation from the historic religious connotations of the word that I would, I would rather see the word pass away, at least for a while. Because if, when I say evangelical, I want people to think about a message of a divine grace in Christ rescuing sinners aware of their need of a savior. If that's what I'm thinking about evangelical and you hear, well, I'm a supporter of a certain political group, there's a fundamental breakdown in, in communication. And if the one word is tasked with bearing that burden, it's too much for that one word. I suspect the same. It's, it's fascinating to, to have the opportunity to sit with you and let you unpack all of this. And I can tell <laughs> that you are skimming the very top of this deep, deep well of knowledge in this content. Thank you for putting it in a way that I can understand. But what an interesting thing to try to track a 500 year tradition yeah, yeah. that doesn't have a Pope, yeah. doesn't have a headquarters, yeah, yeah. no one's in charge of it. Yeah. It has kind of run parallel to the whole Western yeah post-enlightenment experiment of, let's see how this individualism thing works. Let's yeah, see yeah. how freedom of association yeah. works. And unsurprisingly, it has been a little bit tricky and it's a little bit tricky to pin down, but I feel like I've got a much clearer sense of it talking with you. So thank you for gaming it out with me. It means a lot. Let me talk about the book one more time though. So I'm guessing we get a lot deeper into this content yeah, here. Definitely. Where do people pick this up? Just Amazon, wherever you can get uh, Amazon, books? right. Uh, it's a William B. Erdman's publication. And uh, let me just mention one of the essays in the book that I think is, is so important for our discussion. Jamar Tisby is a young African-American theologian and historian. He's published his own book, The Color of Compromise. He has an essay that we ask him to write. Are African-Americans evangelicals? The people who vote 90% for the Democratic candidates. It's a very careful essay. He makes you know, he's an academic too, so he makes qualification. But he says, of course, African-Americans who believe such and such act in such a way are evangelicals. Mm -hmm. So there, uh, there's, a, there's quite a bit of history of history writing. There's quite a bit of attention also to the current American situation, a little bit of attention to the problem of how American circumstances relate to world circumstances. And all of those need a library of books and not just one. Well, I mean, this is fairly thick. This will it's at least get thick. us started, right? It'll get us started, right? Mark, this is a treat. Great. Thank you so, my so privilege. much. My privilege, my privilege. If you've been hanging out with me while we do these go and learn about other expressions of Christianity conversations, you know that this is the part where normally we do the after party and we sit down and we process it all out. And it's one of my favorite kinds of conversations that you and I get to share together. But this time around, I think I want to put that off for a follow-up video. I think this merits more thought and more conversation and just more time than we have right now. So I'm going to sum it up saying this one, Mark Knoll is every bit as incredible as he came off there. This guy is brilliant and humble at the same time. And he is just an absolute fountain of knowledge about this subject matter. It's like one of those things where everybody's got an opinion about evangelicals and what that word means, but does anybody really know has anybody really put in the work or paid attention to the conversation for the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years to know how that conversation has evolved? Well, the answer is yes, someone has. These guys, Mark Knoll, David Bebbington, George Marsden. And to sit with one of these guys and watch him humbly process that out, not just drawing on stuff he's read in books, but stuff that he's attentively lived through and even contributed to, that's, just, that's humbling and that's helpful. And the only way for somebody like you or me to catch up on that conversation 
and not just understand a list of facts about evangelicalism, but understand the history of the conversation, the ebbs and flows, where it went, who responded to what, how we got here in the discussion. The only way to do that is a book like this. I highly recommend this thing. What you're going to get here is not so much a beginning to end textbook history of evangelicalism. Dr. Knoll has a book like that, and you can check that out as well. What you're going to get here is a book that thick that can bring you up to speed and make it like you were paying attention to the conversation with a whole deep reservoir of knowledge yourself over the last half century. And that is the best way to really understand where it's at and to think about where it's going next and where you might fit into that conversation as well. I cannot recommend this book enough. I hope you will check out Evangelicals by Mark Knoll, David Bebbington, and George Marsden. Also, I hope you will click that subscribe button and the obnoxious little gray notification bell so that the internets will tell you when I post this follow-up video so that we can process this more together. Thanks to Dr. Knoll for doing this. Thanks to Wheaton College once again for letting us make use of their facilities. And thank you to you for caring about things like this and for being up for learning about things that maybe aren't your thing because you suspect that there's value in that, that there's value in the people who practice something different than you. What you are doing right now and thinking outside yourself speaks tremendously highly of your character. It's an act of grace, even choosing to watch a video like this and to think about someone else's history and story of their particular expression of faith and ideas. I respect that about you. I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's do this again soon.